Alia and the Last Essays of Alia by Charles Lamb The South Sea House Reader, in thy passage from the bank, where thou hast been receiving thy half-yearly dividends, supposing thou art a lean annuitant like myself, to the flower-pot, to secure a place for Dalston or Shacklewell, or some other thy suburban retreat northerly, didst thou never observe a melancholy-looking, handsome, brick-and-stone edifice to the left, where Threadneedle Street abuts upon Bishop's Gate? I dare say thou hast often admired its magnificent portals, ever gaping wide, and disclosing to view a grave court, with cloisters and pillars, with few or no traces of goers-in or comers-out, a desolation something like Balcluther's. Footnote. I passed by the walls of Balcluther, and they were desolate. Ossian. This was once a house of trade, a centre of busy interests. The throng of merchants was here, the quick pulse of gain, and here some forms of business are still kept up, though the soul may be long since fled. Here are still to be seen stately porticoes, imposing staircases, offices roomy as the state apartments in palaces, deserted or thinly peopled with a few straggling clerks, the still more sacred interiors of court and committee rooms, with venerable faces of beadles, doorkeepers, directors seated in form on solemn days to proclaim a dead dividend, at long worm-eaten tables that have been mahogany, with tarnished gilt leather coverings, supporting massy silver inkstands long since dry, the oaken wainscots hung with pictures of deceased governors and sub-governors, of Queen Anne and the two first monarchs of the Brunswick dynasty, huge charts, which subsequent discoveries have antiquated, dusty maps of Mexico, dim as dreams, and soundings of the Bay of Panama, the long passages hung with buckets, appended in idle row to walls, whose substance might defy any, short of the last, conflagration, with vast ranges of cellarage under all, where dollars and pieces of eight once lay, an unsunned heap, for mammon to have solaced his solitary heart withal, long since dissipated, or scattered into air at the blast of the breaking of that famous bubble. Such is the South Sea House, at least such it was forty years ago, when I knew it a magnificent relic. What alterations may have been made in it since, I have had no opportunities of verifying. Time, I take for granted, has not refreshed it. No wind has resuscitated the face of the sleeping waters. A thicker crust by this time stagnates upon it. The moths that were then battening upon its obsolete ledgers and day-books have rested from their depredations, but other light generations have succeeded, making fine fretwork among their single and double entries. Layers of dust have accumulated, a superfertation of dirt, upon the old layers that seldom used to be disturbed, save by some curious finger now and then, inquisitive to explore the mode of bookkeeping in Queen Anne's reign, or, with less hallowed curiosity, seeking to unveil some of the mysteries of that tremendous hoax, whose extent the petty peculators of our day look back upon with the same expression of incredulous admiration and hopeless ambition of rivalry, as would become the puny face of modern conspiracy contemplating the titan size of Vaux's superhuman plot. Peace to the mains of the bubble! Silence and destitution are upon thy walls, proud house for a memorial. Situated as thou art, in the very heart of stirring and living commerce, amid the fret and fever of speculation, with the bank and change and the India house about thee, in the heyday of present prosperity, with their important faces, as it were, insulting thee, their poor neighbour out of business, to the idle and merely contemplative, to such as me, old house, there is a charm in thy quiet, a cessation a coolness from business, an indolence almost cloistral, 
which is delightful with what reverence have i paced thy great bare rooms and courts at eventide they spoke of the past the shade of some dead accountant with visionary pen in ear would flit by me stiff as in life living accountants and accountants puzzle me i have no skill in figuring but thy great dead tomes which scarce three degenerate clerks of the present day could lift from their enshrining shelves with their old fantastic flourishes and decorative rubric interlacings their sums in triple columnations set down with formal superfluity of ciphers with pious sentences at the beginning without which our religious ancestors never ventured to open a book of business or bill of lading the costly vellum covers of some of them almost persuading us that we are got into some better library are very agreeable and edifying spectacles i can look upon these defunct dragons with complacency thy heavy odd-shaped ivory-handled penknives our ancestors had everything on a larger scale than we have hearts for are as good as anything from herculaneum the pounce boxes of our days have gone retrograde the very clerks which i remember in the south sea house i speak of forty years back had an air very different from those in the public offices that i have had to do with since they partook of the genius of the place they were mostly for the establishment did not admit of superfluous salaries bachelors generally for they had not much to do persons of a curious and speculative turn of mind old-fashioned for a reason mentioned before humorists for they were of all descriptions and not having been brought together in early life which has a tendency to assimilate the members of corporate bodies to each other but for the most part placed in this house in ripe or middle age they necessarily carried into it their separate habits and oddities unqualified if i may so speak as in a common stock hence they formed a sort of noah's ark odd fishes a lane monastery domestic retainers in a great house kept more for show than use yet pleasant fellows full of chat and not a few among them had arrived at considerable proficiency on the german flute the cashier at that time was one evans a cambro briton he had something of the choleric complexion of his countrymen stamped on his visage but was a worthy sensible man at bottom he wore his hair to the last powdered and frizzed out in the fashion which i remember to have seen in caricatures of what were termed in my young days macaronis he was the last of that race of beaux melancholy as a gib cat over his counter all the forenoon i think i see him making up his cash as they call it with tremulous fingers as if he feared every one about him was a defaulter in his hypochondry ready to imagine himself one haunted at least with the idea of the possibility of his becoming one his tristful visage clearing up a little over his roast neck of veal at anderton's at two where his picture still hangs taken a little before his death by desire of the master of the coffee-house which he had frequented for the last five-and-twenty years but not attaining the meridian of its animation till evening brought on the hour of tea and visiting the simultaneous sound of his well-known rap at the door with the stroke of the clock announcing six was a topic of never-failing mirth in the families which this dear old bachelor gladdened with his presence then was his forte his glorified hour how he would chirp and expand over a muffin how would he dilate into secret history his countryman pennant himself in particular 
could not be more eloquent than he in relation to old and new london the sight of old theatres churches streets gone to decay where rosamond's pond stood the mulberry gardens and the conduit in cheap with many a pleasant anecdote derived from paternal tradition of those grotesque figures which hogarth has immortalized in his picture of noon the worthy descendants of those heroic confessors who flying to this country from the wrath of louis the fourteenth and his drug kept alive the flame of pure religion in the sheltering obscurities of hog lane and the vicinity of the seven dials deputy under evans was thomas taine he had the air and stoop of a nobleman you would have taken him for one had you met him in one of the passages leading to westminster hall by stoop i mean that gentle bending of the body forwards which, which in great men must be supposed to be the effect of an habitual condescending attention to the applications of their inferiors while he held you in converse you felt strained to the height in the colloquy the conference over you were at leisure to smile at the comparative insignificance of the pretensions which had just awed you his intellect was of the shallowest order it did not reach to a saw or a proverb his mind was in its original state of white paper a sucking babe might have posed him what was it then was he rich alas no thomas taine was very poor both he and his wife looked outwardly gentlefolks when i fear all was not well at all times within she had a neat meagre person which it was evident she had not sinned in over-pampering but in its veins was noble blood she traced her descent by some labyrinth of relationship which i never thoroughly understood much less can explain with any heraldic certainty at this time of day to the illustrious but unfortunate house of derwentwater this was the secret of thomas's stoop this was the thought the sentiment the bright solitary star of your lives ye mild and happy pair which cheered you in the night of intellect and in the obscurity of your station this was to you instead of riches instead of rank instead of glittering attainments and it was worth them altogether you insulted none with it but while you wore it as a piece of defensive armour only no insult likewise could reach you through it decus et solemen of quite another stamp was the then accountant john tip he neither pretended to high blood nor in good truth cared one fig about the matter he thought an accountant the greatest character in the world and himself the greatest accountant in it yet john was not without his hobby the fiddle relieved his vacant hours he sang certainly with other notes than to the orphean lyre he did indeed scream and scrape most abominably his fine suite of official rooms in threadneedle street which without anything very substantial appended to them were enough to enlarge a man's notion of himself that lived in them i know not who is the occupier of them now resounded fortnightly to the notes of a concert of sweet breasts as our ancestors would have called them culled from club rooms and orchestras chorus singers first and second violoncellos double basses and clarionets who ate his cold mutton and drank his punch and praised his ear he sat like lord midas among them but at the desk tip was quite another sort of creature thence all ideas that were purely ornamental were banished you could not speak of anything romantic without rebuke politics were excluded a newspaper was thought too refined and abstracted the whole duty of man consisted in writing off dividend warrants the striking of the annual balance in the company's books which perhaps differed from the balance of last year in the sum of twenty-six pounds one shilling and sixpence occupied his days and nights for a month previous 
not that tip was blind to the deadness of things as they call them in the city in his beloved house or did not sigh for a return of the old stirring ways when south sea hopes were young he was indeed equal to the wielding of any of the most intricate accounts of the most flourishing company in these or those days but to a genuine accountant the difference of proceeds is as nothing the fractional farthing is as dear to his heart as the thousands which stand before it he is the true actor who whether his part be a prince or a peasant must act it with like intensity with tip form was everything his life was formal his action seemed ruled with a ruler his pen was not less erring than his heart he made the best executor in the world he was plagued with incessant executorships accordingly which excited his spleen and soothed his vanity in equal ratios he would swear for tip swore at the little orphans whose rights he would guard with a tenacity like the grasp of the dying hand that commended their interests to his protection with all this there was about him a sort of timidity his few enemies used to give it a worse name a something which in reference to the dead we will place if you please a little on this side of the heroic nature certainly has been pleased to endow john tip with a sufficient measure of the principle of self-preservation there is a cowardice which we do not despise because it has nothing base or treacherous in its elements it betrays itself not you it is mere temperament the absence of the romantic and the enterprising it sees a lion in the way and will not with fourteen brass greatly find quarrel in a straw when some supposed honour is at stake tip never mounted the box of a stage-coach in his life or leaned against the rails of a balcony or walked upon the ridge of a parapet or looked down a precipice or let off a gun or went upon a water-party or would willingly let you go if he could have helped it neither was it recorded of him that for lucre or for intimidation he ever forsook friend or principle whom next shall we summon from the dusty dead in whom common qualities become uncommon can i forget thee henry mann the wit the polished man of letters the author of the south sea house who never enterest thy office in the morning or quittest it in midday what didst thou in an office without some quirk that left a sting thy jibes and thy jokes are now extinct or survive but in two forgotten volumes which i had the good fortune to rescue from a stall in barbican not three days ago and found three terse fresh epigrammatic as alive thy wit is a little gone by in these fastidious days thy topics are staled by the new-born gourds of the time but great thou used to be in public ledgers and in chronicles upon chatham and shelbourne and rockingham and howe and burgoyne and clinton and the war which ended in the tearing from great britain her rebellious colonies and keppel and wilkes and sawbridge and bull and dunning and pratt and richmond and such small politics a little less facetious and a great deal more obstreperous was fine rattling rattle-headed plumber he was descended not in a right line reader for his lineal pretensions like his personal favoured a little of the sinister bend from the plumbers of hertfordshire so tradition gave him out and certain family features not a little sanctioned the opinion certainly old walter plummer his reputed author had been a rake in his days and visited much in italy and had seen the world he was uncle bachelor uncle to the fine old whig still living who has represented the county in so many successive parliaments 
and has a fine old mansion near where walter flourished in george the second's days and was the same who was summoned before the house of commons about a business of franks with the old duchess of marlborough you may read of it in johnson's life of cave came cave off cleverly in that business it is certain our plumber did nothing to discountenance the rumour he rather seemed pleased whenever it was with all gentleness insinuated but besides his family pretensions plumber was an engaging fellow and sang gloriously not so sweetly sang plumber as thou sangest mild childlike pastoral m a flute's breathing less divinely whispering than thy arcadian melodies when in tones worthy of arden thou didst chant that song sung by amiens to the banished duke which proclaims the winter wind more lenient than for a man to be ungrateful thy sire was old surly m the unapproachable churchwarden of bishopsgate he knew not what he did when he begat thee like spring gentle offspring of blustering winter only unfortunate in thy ending which should have been mild conciliatory swan-like much remains to sing many fantastic shapes rise up but they must be mine in private already i have fooled the reader to the top of his bent else could i omit that strange creature woolet who existed in trying the question and bought litigations and still stranger inimitable solemn hepworth from whose gravity newton might have deduced the law of gravitation how profoundly he would nib a pen with what deliberation he would wet a wafer but it is time to close night's wheels are rattling fast over me it is proper to have done with this solemn mockery reader what if i have been playing with thee all this while peradventure the very names which i have summoned up before thee are fantastic insubstantial like henry pimpernel and old john knapps of greece be satisfied that something answering to them has had a being their importance is from the past End of section 1